comfortable. Good, I'm not gonna have to listen to myself. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, were you still going? I'm sorry, Mindy. Yeah, I'm good. That's, I, I think that, does that, how's yeah, that? Just a, yeah, that sounds good. And Wendy, would you like to introduce yourself? I would. Good afternoon. My name is Wendy Asher. I'm one of the managing attorneys at Southern Arizona Legal Aid. Um, I've spent my entire career as an attorney at Southern Arizona Legal Aid. Before that, I worked with refugees here in Tucson. So I have a lot of experience working at nonprofits and working with populations that are particularly vulnerable to housing situations. Much of the time that I've worked at Legal Aid, I've worked in the area of landlord-tenant matters. So um, I'm pretty familiar with um, the risks and the vulnerability of large parts of our community. Thank you. And um, I've asked uh, two, uh, I've asked Jody Barnes to join us and serve on the subcommittee. Jody, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Good afternoon. I'm Jody Barnes. I work with the city of Tucson in housing and community development. I'm a project manager. Um, I have worked with various populations of homeless persons pretty much my whole life since I was about 20. Um, and it's where my heart is. Um, I also work with contracts and the different funding sources with the city. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And two other people I asked from uh, who work around um, permit supportive housing as well. I've asked Tom Litwicky to join us on our subcommittee. Hi, everybody. I'm Tom. I serve as a CEO for OPCS. And uh, we're a nonprofit organization providing bridge housing, low barrier shelter, and permanent supportive housing support for people who are homeless, essentially trying to kind of fill the gaps of people who can't get into maybe mainstream services and housing. And Thank thrilled you. to be here. Awesome. Thank you. And Terrence, I have asked Terrence to join us on the subcommittee. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Terrence Watkins. I'm the housing director for Community Partners. Um, I've been in housing for about 13 years, um, and I too am a previously homeless individual. I'm actually a graduate of three of Tom Litwicky's amazing programs. Awesome. And we have, uh, so that's our roll call. I did ask also uh, Randy Champion to join our subcommittee, but she couldn't join us today but you'll probably see her in subsequent meetings. Um, and so those, I also wanna allow introductions for those who have joined us. Um, also, I see uh, Joe, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Uh, thanks, Liz. Um, my name is Joe Adino, uh, a Tucson on 35 years, um, founding member and board member of the historic Fourth Avenue Coalition, board member of um, the Barrio Neighborhood Coalition. And um, I loved the comments earlier about housing being a human right and advancing uh, those kind of efforts. So I've been sitting in on uh, the Equitable Housing and Development Commission meetings, and um, I'm just interested in the work and and hope it uh, is moving forward. Thanks. Awesome. And Joe, if you if you after sitting on a few of the listening in on the subcommittees, if you do want to join any of the subcommittees, feel free to let the chair know. Um, and and we can make sure you're included. Um, Ariel, I'm so glad to see you. You want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Ariel Fry. I'm a council aide at the Ward 6 Council Office for Steve Kazachek. Great. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. So um, we have an hour. So we have about another 45 minutes. Um, I. To, uh, the agenda is really to get us all on the same page. Um, since this is our first meeting, I wanna make sure we have the same understanding of the work that we are to do. Um, I am gonna share my screen as I go through on some of the things, but first um, I wanna talk about, have us talk about the purpose of the subcommittee um, and then also see how um, we can nail down a, a regular date once a month for us to meet that works for everyone. Um, but I want to share um, kind of what I'm thinking um, our purpose and mission kind of is. And so I'm going to just read this statement, but I will share it 
um, in an email to all of you, but let me know if you think it's, we should add anything to this. Um, our purpose is to develop recommendations on how to expand permanent supportive housing in the city of T Tucson with the focus on developing and operating permanent supportive housing for men, women, and families overcoming homelessness, including those with mental illness, substance abuse, and medical or other disabling conditions, and assist residents in obtaining remaining and permanent housing, encouraging residents to increase skills and or find employment, fostering self-sufficiency, and improving self-image and supporting recovery and wellness. I didn't write that. I kind of took it from another place, but I thought I thought it captured what I think permanent supportive housing is. Um, so we don't have to agree on this today, but I, I put that out as a potential purpose and mission for this group. And um, we can revisit it, but I'll share it in an email um, when I do my notes. Um, but if anyone wants to react to it right now, or else we can always come back next meeting and discuss it further. Thoughts? Okay. Um, I just have one inclusionary language bit, which is instead of men, women, and families, just people and families for to be more inclusive. I like that because that you can tell it's a little bit outdated. So I like that. Thank you. Um, so we'll just work with that concept or kind of that premise um, for our work. I do want to do a call to audience. Um, that's agenda item number three. And I forgot at the beginning, I do want to make one correction to the agenda. Um, number five, um, it said review of affirmatively furthering fair housing plan. That was a uh, typo. It's just reviewing the affordable housing plan that's due to mayor and council. So if it's okay with all of you, we'll make that change to the agenda. Um, the next item is a call to audience. Is there anyone who would like to speak on any topics or issues related to permanent supportive housing? Okay, not hearing any. Um, again, we'll, we're pretty flexible here. So if someone who's not technically a subcommittee member, um, you're welcome to um, join in on any questions or comments as long as it doesn't take over our meeting. So I say that jokingly. Um, so the fourth item, I do wanna talk about um, permanent supportive, supportive housing model and examples of permanent supportive housing. Um, I want to share first this document, just so let me make sure I have it. It is. Give me just a minute. I apologize. Well, now it has escaped me where that document went. All right. I must have closed a window and didn't realize it, but I can find it pretty quick here. Okay, I found it. Now I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, can you see the form that has the CSH on it? Perfect. So this is a pretty commonly, a pretty well utilized um, document. Um, Corporation, Corporation for Supportive Housing is a well-known national organization. So what I liked about this is it really nails down the key principles of supportive housing. Um, and in practice, supportive housing programs are diverse and intended to have the flexibility to serve a wide range of individuals. And so here, are, I'll share this document as well, but it's about affordability. Um, safety and comfort, um, and then supportive services that are accessible, flexible, and target residential stability, and then empowerment and independence. So I'll share this, and I'm really hoping that all of you will take some time to read through some documents I'm going to be sharing um, so that we have, again, 
maybe having done this work, most of us have done this work for a long time, but there may be some new things or something that refreshes our mind that um, we just haven't thought about. So if we can get into the mind of how do we develop new permit supportive housing projects that we look at the best practices and some of those things. So I'll be sharing the key principles of supportive housing. I also wanted to share a couple of videos of um, some projects, recent projects that I thought were really um, fun to um, listen to, and it won't take very long, but I want to share this with you all. Try this again. Sorry, guys. I'm not the quickest on the fly here. Okay. Uh, hopefully you see the YouTube page. Thank you, Liz. <coughs> of course, there's always ads. Hold on a second. We'll let the ad pass. Okay. Can you hear that? It's not playing. It started all over again. Sorry. All of a sudden it got really loud. Let's try it again. If not, what I'll do is I'll share the links and see if, and then let you watch those on your own. But let's see if it does it this time. Salt Lake City and state leaders celebrated the completion of a new permanent supportive housing complex today. It's called the Magnolia on 300 East in Salt Lake City. As Fox 13's Diego Romo shows us, it will provide permanent housing and other help to 65 people. Three, two, one. No buffering allowed. Well, that's a bummer. <laughs> Okay, well, my idea of showing these videos isn't quite panning out. So I'm going to stop sharing, not to waste everyone's time. Um, there's another one I'll share. So the first one's the Salt Lake City one, 65 units, um, just a, a really good project, very new. Um, the other one is in Boulder, Colorado. That one is for homeless youth. And that one also has a feature of um, providing training and um, basically, uh, I, I think it was some sort of um, culinary type program where people can come and eat and, um, and do some training. So I'll share those two in, in, my, in my email um, with the links. I think, again, these are two current and innovative projects. Um, and and so I know all of you have been involved in other types of projects. So I want to give you guys a chance to talk about other projects you're familiar with. But first, I want to turn it over to Jody to talk about uh, the permit supportive housing projects that we um, operate here at the city. Thanks, Liz. So um, some of our subcontractors are, are in the meeting with us. Both um, CPSA and OPCS are part of some of the programs that we operate. Um, the, I'm going to backtrack just a little and, and say that during the pandemic, and, and you may all be aware of this already, but the city of Tucson joined with many partners um, to provide housing for persons um, that were at high risk for COVID and also um, symptomatic or waiting for their test results or COVID positive. So um, there were approximately 1,200 people that were served through that program. Um, there were three hotels and two shelters. We worked with Pima County, Sullivan Jackson, Catholic Community Services, Primavera, 
OPCS, um, I'm probably forgetting somebody, CBI, um, to provide housing. And the purpose of the housing was not only to provide a safe, healthy place for persons um, during the pandemic, but to move them on to permanent housing. And with the permanent housing, the, the city um, offered 160, approximately 168 homeless preference vouchers in the past year. And then recently at the end of the fiscal year, beginning of the fiscal year, um, began the EHV or emergency housing vouchers program. And there's 202 vouchers with that. All of those programs work with community partners. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, the city administers over 275 year round beds for permanent housing. And those include the Shelter Plus Care 2, Shelter Plus Care 4, ECHO program and the Youth Homeless Demonstration Project. The Youth Homeless Demonstration Project right now has 79 beds that have come online and those are for transitional and permanent housing and both OPCS and SAFE are the um, grantees or the sub-grantees in, in those programs. The city operates, um, you'll, you'll see that we're missing a Shelter Plus Care 3, that's because some of the programs have been consolidated, but the Shelter Plus Care 2 program and Shelter Plus Care 4 program are very similar. Um, Shelter Plus Care 2 works as with our subgrantees of CPSA and the SAFE um, agency. There are 79 units for 174 beds, and um, the, the housing is very similar between both the Shelter Plus Care programs, but um, Originally, Shelter Plus Care 2 with the SAFE agency was to provide um, housing for persons that were HIV positive. So there's 79 units, about 174 beds in Shelter Plus Care 2. Shelter Plus Care 4 works with OPCS, TMM, and CPSA. There are 95 units with 121 beds. And as the funding allows, um, there's usually more units filled. We're, we're at the end of every year, we're over 100% capacity on these programs. The ECHO program, which stands for Ending Chronic Homelessness, has 70 vouchers, Section 8 vouchers, and 13 scattered, scattered site units. Um, the ECHO program was, I, I think, um, really kind of a model program several years ago in, when it began. And it currently works with OPCS and COPE Behavioral Health Services. It provides intensive supportive services, housing, permanent housing, case management, direct links with employment. Um, and each agency does an individual service plan with the client as well as providing mental health services where needed and, and linkage with other programs. Um, there are caseworkers that are source certified, and we also work with Sullivan Jackson Employment Center to link clients with training and, and um, employment. The programs, I think it's pretty neat in that at least up until the pandemic, we were providing a lot of volunteer opportunities for clients. Um, we had a street cleanup program and um, through the um, now I'm thinking, I can't think of the name, but Tucson Cleans, what is it? Anyway, the, the oh. street cleanup program. Um, and we've had picnics to honor the clients that have really moved ahead and, and that sort of thing. Um, we are looking at ways to expand the supportive services. Um, we have intensive supportive services with the ECHO program, not so much with Shelter Plus Care 2 and 4 um, because of the way the programs are set up but we are looking at ways to expand that and, and have equal supportive services and case management between all the programs. Any questions? I do have a question, Jody. And all those, are, are any of those in single buildings or are they all scattered sites like vouchers? Good point. They are all scattered site. There's no one building. Um, so we are working with landlords on all the units. So I will say that's really it. So I feel like I've had, um, uh, what's the word, uh, um, paradigm shift around um, 
uh, how we do permanent supportive housing. So I'm super, my, I've always been of the opinion that the way we're doing it here, uh, the way the, the programs that Jody's talking about is the best use of, of a lot of the continuum care funding. Um, and I'll talk about my shift in a minute. When I worked in Maricopa County for eight years, did permanent supportive housing with behavioral health, um, those were like vouchers where people could select their housing and services were provided to them um, through the behavioral health authority and, and having on, you know, their services pro provided to them, um, but they were integrated into the community. I still think that's the way to go. The interesting part where my paradigm shift has happened is, and, and the reason I also think it's good, I forgot to mention is it's cheaper. It's cheaper than building a building um, and so you can get a lot more vouchers out of the funding than to build a building. Um, but since uh, in the last couple of years, as I've seen the changes in the rental market and how hard it is sometimes to utilize these vouchers, I've learned the need to do both, um, not to have just one or the other, but really to do more, um, to, to really look at how we can do more dedicated projects where the asset it doesn't go away um, when the rental market goes bad. So the so some of the projects that I was going to share um, it are those where these communities have built projects and the services are on site. Down, often in the, you know there could be a clinic on the bottom, uh, workforce uh, services on site where people can access them. So I do think uh, in my mind. As we continue to do more, I think it's important to do more of these um, scattered site type projects, but also um, figure out how we can do some dedicated uh, development projects of permit supportive housing. So that's just my kind of my growth and kind of where I, I learned that there's value in both. Um, it might be expensive, but it doesn't it doesn't go away, right? Um, so. Just some thoughts, and I wanted to ask uh, those of you that work on some of these projects, what uh, if you have anything to add on what Jody shared, um, the value, some some key things that you've that we've been able to do through these programs. Um, if I can, I worked on shelter plus care too, um, and one project that wasn't mentioned, which was Project Vienna Star, and that's also a permanent and supportive housing program for people living with mental illness. Um, and uh, I totally agree that clinics are necessary. Um, I know that a lot of funds were used for getting people in taxis for, I can't tell you how many times I walked into people's homes and saw MRSA infections that were like near septic. And it, I had one person who had a MRSA infection for two years and the it is like a fear of engagement and care and also just like the distance to care and the, the amount of engagement in urgent care clinics and emergency rooms is just devastating in the disability community so to have access to clinics is absolutely essential for everyone on the spectrum of disability and having it in a way that is like easy to get to on a bus or like when I have would have these like case management conversations like it would be like I walked into someone's house and I see like you know something and I would be like so how do you want to get there like do you even want to get there and that's how sometimes people end up with the two-year long infections is you know it's motivated by them and then one other thing I wanted to bring up is like the core training um that was mentioned uh and I went to that training I think it has some some perks, but I think that it also could use some updating. Um, a lot of the training videos were from like the 90s. Um, a lot of the ideology um, was around like multiculturalism, which is a little bit outdated. So um, I think that, you know, for the onboarding training to be outdated is not necessarily supportive to the people serving clients or the clients themselves. Thanks, Liz. Tom? He's similar. It's uh, what you had said about the, the vouchers. And I think with these types of programs, it's the ideal that people are able to 
live where they want to live and they're integrated in, in the community. Um, um, I still have a, a bit of a bias based on the money and the fact that it isn't integrated to have project-based, but I, I also get that it's, it's part of the mix. It's, it's, there are people that also will prefer that and that will meet their needs better. So I guess there isn't a one size fits all is what I'd say. I will say that um, with these voucher programs and any voucher programs in, in my experience now, it seems that the one of the things that, that might help voucher programs would be if they were, if the vouchers were able to respond to the market quicker. And because you've got a, it's a market-based housing system so then the vouchers to work within a market market-based housing system have to meet that. Yeah. So right now we may have a landlord with an opening, but they're able to get more rent and not have to go through any kind of bureaucratic hoops to do it because it's with someone who can pay the rent at hundred dollars more a month. And so it's very hard to, and, and I know that might even sound from someone like yourself, Liz, or others on this call that have worked in the system a long time that may, seem naive to even try and change that but it seems like it doesn't fit it's a it's a no it's a static kind of a system that's trying to work within a market based system and and they keep bumping into each other so it's interesting a couple of things that come to my mind i was talking to the my colleague at maricopa county housing authority uh, she is on the Arizona Multi-Housing Association, and one of the things that came out of their, one of their recent retreats is that there's a lot of corporate uh, property management companies utilizing software where the, the rents are being determined daily based on uh, some algorithm, and so those rents can literally change mm -hmm. from one day to the next. Um, HUD just published for the October fair market rents. Um, and they have found that those that data is typically two years behind the market. And here we are trying to implement uh, an increase again on our payment standards, but usually it takes a month or two for us to be able to implement them as well. So even when HUD puts them out, it still takes us two to three months to get them out. So it is, it is uh, absolutely true that we are, even when we do increase our payment standards, which has its, um, on the, on the actual Section 8 voucher program has its drawbacks because then it means we're serving less people too, because the more costs, the less vouchers we can support. So there's a lot of impact um, with what's going on in the market, but it, you know, I, I do think uh, being able to be competitive is necessary if we're going to get people housed. Um, so, so those are... It, it may be, I guess, a different way of saying it too, Liz, in a more productive way on my part to say it would be, you know, what are the other sources of funding that we can use to backfill that and be more responsive to the market? Because, and, you know, I'm the CEO, so I don't know all the details of, you know, what's how they actually do the lease and everything, but I've heard in the past, like we've looked at it as an agency to say, okay, there's a gap for whatever reason, $50 a month. And we've said, you know, we have donors, we'll pay the $50 a month. We'll pay a year's worth of it. And sometimes I think what I heard back from a systematic kind of view was that's not allowed, that that's something we're doing that wouldn't be allowed. And it's like, but we'll pay for it. We'll just pay a year. We have donors, they'll, they'll cover it. Because otherwise, you know, even, even when the market was good, people can't necessarily live in the neighborhood they want, in the school they want, and the, but we can get the money. Mm -hmm. and put it in and that might not be super scalable i don't know but for us it's scalable yeah we did something a little different typically when it's coming from an outside source it's considered income if it's on the section 8 voucher program so it, it counts against the household's income what we did do with our landlord incentive program is we and it's only for a year's worth likely the person may be in a situation the next year to have to move if we can't be responsive on the rent but we are doing that with the landlord incentive program so we've kind of figured out a way to get a loophole where it's not a third party but it's us kind of negotiating that um, but it i think it's a i think it's something we should keep it on as a how do we address that um, for those programs um, whether it's 
Section 8 or other or rapid rehousing, you know, we need to be, we need to talk because those are the programs that are going to get um, our, our um, community members that are homeless off the streets. So what can we do to, what are strategies to ensure that they're um, getting housed quickly and, and, and um, long term? So Thank I kind of like I kind of like that as being one of our goals is strategies around the and we'll call it tenant based rental assistance. Um, that's probably the easier way than vouchers. Um, and then you mentioned project based. So tenant based means they get to take it. It's based on the tenant finding their housing. So we'll call that um, um, as one of our strategies we can look towards. The other thing I want to um, highlight is. Um, as we're looking at potential, so we don't know exactly what we're going to work on. That's what I'm hoping. Um, we don't have to figure that out today, um, but I do hope in the next meeting we have we can develop some real strategies around this. The qualified allocation plan for low income housing tax credit projects, which we know is what helps develop a lot of the housing that is built today. Oh, not Terrence. I'm sorry. I'll get to you in just a second. Um, is that they did include. Um, 30 points for supportive housing. They they cut out a lot from the from the documents in the past, but that remained in there as one of the scoring criteria. So it's good to know from a state perspective um, that they are um, prioritizing that. So I just wanted to share that piece of news as we're thinking about potential funding sources. Um, we know continuum of care right now has is open for applications. Um, and so as we think about what are potential places, whether it's this year or future years with continuum of care, that's a place where we can look at um, how do we do more permanent supportive housing for, for those who are homeless. Terrence, I'm sorry I didn't see your hand. Oh, no problem. I didn't raise it until after you started talking. Oh, okay. Um, so I personally love the fact that the idea of doing the diversification. Mm -hmm. um, I like project-based programs. Um, I know that it's not totally in line with Housing First because it's it's more centralized and it's not in the community as much as it could, should, would be. Um, but for me, I find that we are able to deliver a lot more supportive services in a lot shorter period of time. We're able to reach more people when they're here together. So we, we can we can start doing employment groups and the employer the employment staff are able to be on site and the case managers are able to be on site, and so I also understand that the need for permanent supportive housing through vouchers. So to echo what you were saying earlier, I'm more in favor of having both. Um, with with the vouchers, excuse me. Um, there's a 13 percent increase in rent in the last year, mm -hmm. so. HUD's FMR that they released from 728 to 761, that was a pretty significant jump as far as FMRs are concerned, but it didn't come close to touching what the market did with uh, during the pandemic. Um, we're now a, a one bedroom is 860 bucks. Yeah. So uh, I, I, when we have project base that are capped at matching FMR, it ensures that to me, I, I know that we we put out a lot more money up front to build these structures, but it in the long run, it kind of guarantees that we can continue to house individuals in the future. So it's uh, it's more money up front, but it's an investment to always be able to provide the services that we need to provide. That's very, very true. Thank you for that. Joe? Oh, I'm good. That was just applause for Hi. investing in permanent just supportive applause. housing. <laughs> we all um, like that. Yeah. Uh, Mindy? <clears throat> I know that our time is short. We're coming to a close. Um, but there were, I wanted to make sure that I brought up a couple of pieces of information that I need to know um, mm -hmm. and also want to share with you that there. I don't believe that this would be an appropriate place for a um, a homeless village. Um, Salt Lake City is also doing a village, not just that one project. They're doing a whole huge village with a supermarket, with a market in it, with Airbnb rentals in it, with a restaurant in it. It's 
a huge, beautiful, incredible project. Um, but there's 80 acres a doctor is willing to donate his land, but it's out by three points. Um, and I think it would be a great place to open a program for people with criminal chronic histories of chronic histories of criminal engagement with their revolving door. Um, I don't know what their criteria is yet, but I'm going to find out. I'd like to know what city land is available or county land that could be donated to a project village. Um, and, um, and I also have concerns about Section 8 housing and the vouchers and where those locations usually have been or are in low, very, very low income, high drug use neighborhoods where bed bugs are rampant and neighbors are trying to get their, get our folks using with them. Uh, it's, I, I, I love the conventional housing program that Tucson has. I, they always, they're, they've always been clean and nice. So I, I think a mix is important, but when we talk about, and when we talk about vouchers and when we talk about the availability of rentals, we need to get our people out of those neighborhoods. So I'll respond to your couple points and then I'll move over to Liz and then Terrence. Um, really quick, so the city land, it's, it's a little bit, so I'll just say this, what land we have, we can't donate, just so you know. So that there's there's a gift clause thing that had that was a lawsuit. So what we are working on with our, the city land is to do projects, co-development projects um, with developers, with our service providers. That's the plan on what we plan to use those projects on. So we have so if we're going to do a, let's say we want to do this vi uh, village concept that Salt Lake City does, the city would want to go into kind of a partnership or some sort of deal where we work, um, but it, there's, there's, it's not giving it away. So I don't, I, just to clarify that, I don't think that's what you meant, just give it away, but that just to clarify that we're working on one particular property that I would, I'm really wanting to do a permanent supportive housing project, but I want it to be a, a co-development kind of uh, project that we do. Um, but the, but anything that's outside the city jurisdiction will be harder for us to partner on but I'm sure the county would be very much supportive of that. The other thing around Section 8, um, we're mandated by HUD to try to encourage people not to go into those areas. So we provide them materials and education, but in the end, it's always the tenant's choice. And so it gets very difficult for us to say, don't live here, don't live there, because often those are the only units um, that they're able to be eligible for. So that's, I think, something we should always strive for, Mindy, is definitely try to get them to not be in those areas and those type of properties. So we're, we're in alliance with that. The hard part is how do we do that and continue to provide the best opportunities for them to live elsewhere, right? So just wanted to make sure I gave you some responses on that. Uh, Liz? Yeah, um, so I just want to say first off, the idea of a co-development is amazing. I'm a huge fan of mixed income um, project-based development, and I'm really happy to hear that. Um, also, um, as someone who used to assist people in HPP applications, COPPA ENT, General Section 8, um, we would refer people to the gosectionate.com website, and that's where landlords post their listings. And those listings are, you know, in parts of town that are, you know, food deserts, that don't have transportation, that have vacant lots, that um, are all the things that um, we, we have expressed concerns about. And I get that it's available housing. I do get that it's available housing. So to say that it's a tenant's choice is like, more to say it's like a Sophie's choice. Um, so I don't know that it's necessarily a tenant's choice. Um, but uh, what I wanted to bring up was, um, have we taken a temperature on like landlord willingness to engage in vouchers or subsidized housing, housing subsidy in general? Has there been any sort of like push to educate landlords about like general housing subsidy or um, anything like that, because there's this really cool study out of like Miami-Dade County from 2017 about like their willingness to accept, um, you know, larger 
deposits. Surprisingly, landlords like didn't care about larger deposits in that particular jurisdiction. I don't think that's necessarily true here and now. Um, but I mean, like a lot of the information that was contained there was basically that just like landlords wanted to vent. <laughs> they had a lot of feelings they wanted to express. Well, it's really, um, so we, with the landlord, before, even before the landlord incentive program, like we created a landlord team with the purpose of really engaging landlords. It's worked, except a lot of the landlords we're still hearing from that want to keep working with us or saying our rents are increasing. So they're just, we're just not going to be able to continue to work. But um, we do have a video we just did with one of our landlords um, with the idea of getting some more campaigning and educating out there, but we have the resources in house. Um, we also have, um, we're bringing, we've brought on a couple of outreach, uh, landlord outreach people. Um, we know different uh, homey that's working with OPCS and CBI, they have a landlord outreach. So there's a lot of engagement happening with landlords from different um, perspectives, but we can't stop. I mean, we got to keep finding new ways to do that. So we got, so that could be part of our, our, our strategies is how to continue to, to do some of those ideas and things that you're, you're talking about, Liz. All right, and I'm gonna, Terrence and Wendy, and then I do wanna go through one more thing before we close our meeting. We only have nine minutes, so Wendy? Oh, I'm sorry, Terrence? All right, so I, I also wanted to add into there. Um, so yes, Liz, we have been checking the temperature on landlords' willingness to rent to us, and it's, it's frigid to say the best. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the landlords, uh, Part of what has happened here with all of the units being bought up by out-of-town companies is they come in and they're immediately kicking out any, or I'm sorry, they're not kicking out. They are non-renewing their leases at expiration for anyone who is receiving a third-party subsidy payment. They don't want to deal with it. it it's too many, it, it's too many problems. Uh, the news, I think it was Kega 9 just did an investigation on Catalina Towers, which for like two decades has been the leading place in accepting subsidies, but now they're not accepting any anymore. Um, and it's, it's a massive growing trend. So uh, Mindy, when you talked about where the tenants are living, it's partly because a lot of the people who get accepted for our programs, um, they all, a lot of them have criminal, criminal records or they have previous evictions and all of the bigger, nicer apartment complexes say, absolutely not. No. Um, Doug Ducey signed into law a couple of years ago that they can't just automatically say no. They'll say, so they're like, all right, no. And then you file the appeal and they say, thank you for the appeal. No. And, and it's, so that's all that's really happened in this. Uh, so individuals aren't being able to move into these nicer apartment complexes. The vouchers can't pay the cost and, uh, the vouch the apartment complexes themselves are just saying no vouchers. So that or, or I had one the other day that said, yeah, we accept vouchers, but the member has to income qualify aside from the voucher, which if they qualified, they wouldn't be on a voucher. So um, it's societally, systemically set up to where the individual's options for where they can live with our, with our vouchers and programs is extremely limited. And the people who are accepting them are accepting them all. So that's why you end up getting these 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 congregations of individuals who just aren't doing very well in life right now and that that's that's kind of the reason why we're at where we're at so for me i also believe that's another reason to advocate for uh, being able to set up project base where we can control that um, and, and with more staff there, we can have a better control of the program and it's just not running as rampant as all of these other, all of these other properties that will accept the vouchers are. Thanks, Terrence. Wendy? Yeah, so I just had a couple of points. The first one is that um, while it may sound like a great idea as incentive to increase deposits that go to landlords, there's a statutory limit on how much the security deposit and other fees can be as deposits. So you need to be mindful of that. Um, most landlords are already charging the max of what they can anyway. Um, and I think some of what our conversations point out is that there's no one answer to how to resolve this problem. You know, there are pluses and minuses to um, 
tenant and choice, there are pluses and minuses to creating community housing where there's a, a, a property that's dedicated to low income. Sometimes that sounds very supportive of folks, but in other ways, it just compounds some of their issues. And you know, a family that's doing okay is then surrounded by some families who aren't doing okay. Um, I've had some, some exposure to uh, some programs like that. And on one hand, they sound great. On another, they, they don't necessarily work unless there's significant support of the folks who are living there so that their issues don't become exacerbated. And then I also want us to be mindful of um, being critical of families that choose an option of housing that we ourselves do not necessarily feel is the best option. I have a lot of folks who come into our agency who are living in what I would consider really crappy substandard mobile homes that they've purchased because they think it's better to own something. And they're literally owning something that isn't even a money pit, it's just falling apart. And they end up getting sucked into something that really isn't livable for them, but they want to own something. It's part of how they feel more secure. And while we know that people sometimes can't find somewhere to rent when they've got a voucher from Section 8, except in somewhere that's not a particularly attractive place to live, at the same time, that may be where their family is. That may be where they live. So I just want us to be cautious of um, putting too many value judgments on the choices that people make, even though Liz is right, the other Liz is right that, um, it's not always a choice, it's just what's available. Thanks. Thanks, Wendy. Joe? I know we're about out of time, but I, I wanted to ask a quick question for Terrence. Um, these non-expiration or non-renewals that you're talking, talking about um, for voucher holders, is this an area where you think source of income protection would have a big impact? Or uh, do you think there'd be another way around that and, and um, that wouldn't really be a fix? You're a lawyer, huh, Joe? What's that? Are you a lawyer? I'm an IT guy. <laughs> All right. So we, we, there has been talk about it before where people have tried to say, is that discrimination based on source of income and it's based on them having a disability? Uh, I, I am not a lawyer. And so I have not been able to take up that fight. Um, and I think it's just gone on challenged so long that it's just become the normal operating, the normal, normal way that the landlords are operating. Um, a lot of our members, uh, community partners, we specialize in housing individuals with serious mental illness. So the vast majority of our members, uh, they're in housing because they have a disability. So I, it wouldn't be a really long jump or leap um, to say, yeah, you're discriminating on a person based on a disability. But then that comes to the question of who has the lawyers, who has the money to fight this with all of the landlords and get the statutes going and, and then pr prosecuting each person who violates it. So uh, I appreciate Tom's thing. I don't think we're ever going to address the rent issue, Tom, but we definitely, that would address the, the income. I, I thrown it out. Um, I think that may be one of my recommendations. My concern is um, from the state level, the, the governor signed a bill that says we can't change the landlord tenant act on, just on a jurisdictional level. But if we try to add, we do have a local fair housing ordinance that um, if we tried to do a, a local source of income, I've asked my, our city attorney um, to consider if what, you know, what would we be up against? We're kind of fighting the state on a few different things right now, um, but I could see us getting a lot of pushback. Um, but I do think that is probably one of our key wins if we could ever get there would to do be a source of income protection because then people couldn't be denied um we they could be denied because they the rent is too high for the program but but that doesn't but we still need at least some wins around um people being accepted so i do we need all need to if, whether you pray or you do something else we all need to put our minds together on this and figure out how we can um make that work the last thing I want to do to close out the meeting, um, at, on August 10th, around the affordable housing discussion, Mayor and Council did direct um, the Housing Community Development Department to develop a comprehensive affordable housing strategic plan 
working with the Commission on Equitable Housing and Development to include in the plan revenue sources, short, medium, and long-term goals, and to return with a draft of the plan in 90 days, which is in November, with an emphasis on developing specifics for those short-term goals. My hope is with this, um, with this subcommittee in the next meeting, if we can um, provide some input on potential recommendations around permanent supportive housing, I would really love um, to um, offer some um, short-term and medium and long-term goals around permanent supportive housing. Um, and so that's what I'm hoping we can work on in the next meeting. Um, and all, and uh, continuing to talk about what are some things we want out, out of this committee uh, beyond that piece uh, that we want to try to provide to give back to the, com the overall commission so that we can continue to provide recommendations to mayor council about those things that will help move the needle. Um, and so I, I will, what I plan to share with you in addition, uh, I told you I'll send this document. It also has kind of the timeline and what we think the plan will outline for the, for the affordable housing plan. It's totally in draft form. So we are literally still working on it. I plan to have additional meetings to add, to figure out what else we want in the plan. But I'm gonna share it with this subcommittee so that if you have any thoughts or ideas, um, you are welcome to provide those to me. Um, our next meeting, do you guys mind if we look at our calendars? So today is technically the second Thursday of the month. I don't know if you guys mind continuing on the second Thursday of the month um, at 4 p.m. The next Liz, one, is, uh, yes. So um, I was listening to what you're saying right now that by November, we need to have, we have kind of a lot of work to do before November. Uh, do we need to push it out a month? And I, I am, I really hate Zoom meetings with the passion of a thousand fiery suns. Uh, <laughs> but with that being said, if we, I, I feel if we have that much project and we, we really have something to do, then there's a reason for the meeting. So I, my thing is if we're working on a project, then maybe we need to meet more often that. And I want to, I'm, I'm willing and able, I also respect that people have a lot of other things going on. So if we can plan meetings and if people, um, what I'd like to do is definitely keep it to once a month, but if we can do a, 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 an additional meeting um, between now and the next one, I'm, I'm okay with that. I just want to make sure it, it fits with everyone's calendars. So if we wanted to meet in two weeks, it could be the 23rd. Um, at 4 p.m. Uh, does that work for everyone? Could you say that again? The 23rd at 4 p.m. It's a Thursday. Does anyone not be able to attend that one? I'm starting a new job and I don't know kind of what the you know, orientation uh, process is like. Well, what we'll do is um, help, and I just want to confirm, how about just so we stick to the second Thursdays does, at 4 p.m. for now, does that seem to work with everyone? Yes. Okay. So I would, I would like to meet on the 23rd. Also. Okay. So we'll do a 23rd. Yeah, meet without me. Okay. We'll hey, do the 23rd. Congratulations on your new job. Okay. Uh, Tom, were you saying something? I just couldn't imagine this meeting without Liz. That's all. Me too. I know. Well, and what we'll do is you let us know later, Liz, if that works or doesn't work. And if we need to, we'll move it. But so far right now, the 23rd and the 14th work for everyone. Okay. So we'll do that and um, keep it at 4 p.m. And I appreciate you guys. Can I, can I ask one thing before we recess or whatever? Um, I, I know we're called permanent and supportive housing. And that was kind of like a name that was just given to us. Um, we're talking about housing that's more than permanent and supportive housing. Do you think that housing first would be a better name for us? I know that it's primarily permanent and supportive housing, but there's people thoughts. I'm, I'm perfectly open. I, I'd like to ensure that we talk about, that we identify, we're talking about unhoused people. So housing first for unhoused people. Uh, well, that's not the right word, but um, maybe we say subcommittee for uh, to provide housing for those um, 
housing first programs for those who are experiencing homelessness. And we'll figure out a nice little acronym for it. How's that? Instead of PSH. Okay, we can do that. Any other thoughts? Well, if there's no other thoughts, I will call this meeting to end and adjourn the meeting. I appreciate everyone for your time. And Liz, are you going to email us um, all those links and the paper that you? Yes, Thank the you. document will have the links in the document. Thank you. So it'll be what everything I threw in there in the kitchen sink. So have fun looking at what I provided. So, all right. Thanks, you guys. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations, Bye. Liz. Thank you. Yeah, Enjoy. good job. Thank you.